We all make mistakes. We all have failures. Praise God. Amen. I'm not what I want to be. But I'm going to work towards I want to, where I want to be. I'm going to, I'm going to work towards that. Amen. Praise God. You can be seated tonight. I mean, you can't be a prayer warrior if you don't pray. But if I pray five minutes a day, I've started. Five minutes leads to ten minutes. Ten minutes leads to fifteen minutes. Amen. I got a prayer list and, you know, I can get lost praying for my prayer list. I got lots of names on my prayer list. A lot of folks here I'm praying for. I'm, I'm starting to have to add names. I love that. I get to add names. I get to update my prayer list. Why? Because there's new folks coming into my world, and I got to pray for them. God to help them. Amen, amen. What a wonderful time we had in the Lord this morning. Praise God. I saw dancing. I saw shouting. I saw running. Amen. And then, you know, after church, a few came up to me and thanked me for preaching what I preached, and that made me feel good. Okay, well, let me. I'm not as human as y'all are. I'm more so. Hey, I appreciate it when I know that I've heard from the Lord and it had a place to go. I don't always necessarily look at the, you know, people running and jumping about. That's great. God does that by himself. He don't need my help. But he needs my help sometimes to give the word. Amen. Praise God. Brother, brother, brother Jeff Arnold, we was listening to him preach about vessels. He was talking about when Jesus died on the cross and went to the grave and was resurrected. After that, he was resurrected. He never did another miracle. Because he no longer had the vessel. But on the day of Pentecost, that comforter came down and he filled 120 vessels. <laughs> and in 2018, amen, at Peace Tabernacle, he's filling over another 100 and something vessels in Jesus' name. I just want to be a vessel. Praise God. Amen, amen. Praise God. I see that name and it messes with me. But I know it's Bouget, right? Bouchois, see? Her roots. Y'all might be kin folks. <laughs> Brother Myers from Louisiana. I know that's a good Louisiana name. But Sister Sarah, can I just call you Sister Sarah tonight? Amen. I don't, my name's Bumgarner. Believe me, if a name can be twisted and turned, it's been Gumbarner. It's, you know, sometimes they put a D instead of a B, you know, uh-huh, but, you know, that my, they, they tell me, now I know my name has a German root, but uh, they said back in the day when the guys that were riding the rails, my name was Garner, like my cousin James. James Garner. His real name's James Bumgarner, so don't go there. <laughs> Look it up. Google it. He needed salvation more than he needed Hollywood. <laughs> Praise God. But don't they used to say go bum the Garners, you know, when the bums would come through? I don't know. Aren't you glad you got your name? Amen. Amen. You know, my children, they complain about it sometimes because they got to write it. I said, but you be proud of that name. That means we take care of people. Baumgartner's German for tree gardener. Someone that takes care of things. You can be proud of it, son. But Sister Sarah, we baptize you this morning. Amen, Brother Joshua. We want to give you your baptismal certificate so you can take it. Everybody give the Lord a hand clap of praise. She's got the name. She's got the spirit. She's part of the family. I rejoice in that. 
Amen. Well, you ought to, the whole, all of heaven rejoiced. All of heaven rejoiced. Last Thursday night in that dorm room, she began to speak in that unknown language, and, and Jesus said, hey, pay attention. See that in that little room? See that? Oh, let's all have ourselves a time. Praise God. I, I rejoice in that. One. Bible says it just takes one. To say, Jesus, I want you. Praise God. Well, you can be seated. I'm not trying to preach tonight. Praise God. Brother Thomas and I, we was traveling. We was on the highway, and we got the word. And Sister Brandy, I just want you to know, I told him not to call you. He had already called her. And she was just about to go to sleep. So by that time, we knew she was asleep. He's like, you going to call your wife? I said, absolutely not. I like life. Life likes me. Me and life, we agree. <laughs> I'm not calling her. I'll tell her in the morning. Which I did, first thing. But I knew she was awake. But we're so excited to have you with us. Amen. And I'm thankful for what God is doing with our college ministry now and everyone that's gotten on board with that. Praise God. And with that being said, we do have some announcements. And I know if they say from this morning or do, well, let me see if I can remember them. Everybody say, try your memory, Pastor. <laughs> fundraiser, March 8th. Amen. That's a barbecue fundraiser. Let me just tell you, we've gotten that streamlined. And I'm just going to ask you right now over pulpit, if you've helped with that in the past, if you will work your portion of that, it will go streamline. The briskets, amen. I know we're probably going to need some to donate briskets. I'll donate a couple of briskets. And, uh, I mean, we've got that settled now. We have a man that's not part of our church yet, but I'll claim him. Hey, he's running for school board. I'll claim him. And he likes to barbecue. He told Brother Thomas, Hey, I'm doing a big barbecue that weekend. You just bring them to me. I'll take care of them. You won't even have to mess with them. <laughs> Amen. We're going to purchase a meat grinder. So we take care of that brisket real fast. Praise God for that. Amen. We got a streamline. So if you've helped in the past and you want to help in the present, I'll let you. That's reasonable. And then we need to do everything we can because what we're going to use this, the funds from this for is towards getting our sanctuary remodel going. Amen. I, I, I'd like to have that done. Uh, we're hosting a ladies' meeting, I believe, the first week of May. I'd like to have the sanctuary remodeled by the, by the time that lady meeting's come around. Wouldn't you? I'd like to see it done. So I uh, rejoice in everything the Lord is doing. And then we have our uh, Brother Staines, where are you at? What is it called over in Katy? Friday Night Fire. And when is it? The 23rd of next Friday? 7 o'clock. We're leaving here at what time? Leaving here by 5.30. All the young people say amen. amen. Brother Sis is going to be doing the driving. Amen. Well, I'm okay with that. Amen. And then we have a hyphen rally slash youth rally in Victoria coming up in March. Amen. I believe it's March 9th. So we got a lot of things going on. Amen. Amen. Then, of course, ladies conference over in San Marcos. If you ladies haven't registered and you want to go, you can register. It's going to be at the Embassy Suites. And uh, it's March 2nd and 3rd, I believe. Brother Raymond Woodward, who's a phenomenal teacher. I'm almost tempted to go over there, sneak in as a pastor just so I can hear him teach. Following up, and then, amen, you won't go wrong with those that are speaking. And uh, so there's lots of good things happening. Amen. And then we have HYC Holiday Youth Convention in San Marcos. 29th and 30th. And here's my challenge to my young people. Are y'all ready? If you will go, we will pay your way. I said young person. Are, well, 
<laughs> and she's got the smile to prove it. Amen. I praise God for that. So I'm challenging. So we need to get registered. So we'll know how many rooms to get. Amen. And we'll make sure the boys have a room and the girls have a room. And we'll make sure you have the proper chaperones. But we're going to have a good, t it's going to be a wonderful time. And I believe Josh Carson is the main speaker. Amen. He's a phenomenal preacher, so you will not want to miss that. So you can't tell me you don't have nothing going on, young people. You have no excuses. We ain't got no money. I'm paying for it. Well, praise God. So, the Lord be praised. And the devil be a liar. Amen. Now, did I catch everything? Sister Baumgartner's home with Jordan tonight. And Jordan's not feeling well. I could tell she wasn't feeling well. When she wants me to hold her and cuddle her, she's not feeling well. But so, pray for little Jordan. Amen. Pray for Sister Bumgar. Um, so she always keeps me in line about announcements. But I believe that is all our announcements. And so we rejoice in what God is doing. Amen. Tuesday night prayer meeting, Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. We're going to start our new Live, Love, and Serve class in the back. Not this week, but the following week. So, all right. It's good to know. And uh, we are just going to see God do, uh, raising up those. Now, for those that want to be in the Live, Love, and Serve class, that is a class where, you know, you've just gotten in church. You want to become a part of what we're doing. We want you to go through that class so that you can be a Sunday school teacher or an usher or a praise singer or a hostess or a host or sound. You know what? You need to find a job. Look at somebody and say, I need to find a job. Now, some of y'all have jobs, and that's good. But if you don't have a job in the church, you ought to say, Lord, where do you want me? Lord, where can I serve? Where can I be a part? It's not a lack. It's not. It's, it's on you. It's not on me. You come and send me, Pastor. I need. I want to do something. Hey, praise God. Amen. Well, you say, well, I want to take you know, food for the young people. Praise God, you can do that. Or you want to start a ministry in in one of the senior care facilities. We can do that too. It's. Yeah. Where your heart is, it's where your treasures are. So if your heart's into that computer, that's where you'll spend your time. Well, I need to stop meddling. I ain't the preacher tonight. I'm thankful that my nephew has come our way, and I'm grateful for Brother Sisk. And... I appreciate his burden to serve and uh, live for God. Uh, I do believe that he is here for this season of his life, but he will be going on to greater things. Don't know how long. We've kind of got a plan put together, and I believe if he sticks to the plan. God will bless it. But I want him to come tonight, and I want him to minister the word of the Lord. Everybody say, God bless you, Brother Sisk. God bless you, Brother Sisk. Praise, God. Praise God. All right. Praise the Lord, everybody. If you would stand for the reading of the word. Uh, I am preaching on faith tonight, and this is my first time to preach off of an iPad. Uh, I brought paper just in case. So, faith in the, the system that Apple put out is one thing. Faith in a battery that's only half charged is otherwise. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If you turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, and uh, I thank Brother, uh, Brother Sanchez, for, or Sanchez, I'm sorry, for being sensitive to the Holy Ghost. I, I had direction. I felt very strongly about the direction I was going to go. But you know, there's always an element of you that craves a little confirmation from the Lord. And uh, when he got up here and started talking about faith, I was just like, yes, thank you, God. Uh, Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 4. If you have it, say amen. amen. Oh, I have power. Thank you, God. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. 
For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And skip down to verse 30. I was going to read you the whole chapter, but I don't think you want to stand that long. Verse 30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after, the, after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, and escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to, fight the, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all, these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Praise the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, this service is in your hand. Lord Jesus, we present our, our bodies a living sacrifice. God, we pray that the Spirit of God would flow in this place, would flow in our midst, God. We give you total and complete control of this service. We give you total and complete control of this time. We pray, God, be glorified. In Jesus' name, everybody shout amen. amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. The title of the message tonight is The Nature of Faith. And I apologize to the hyphen people that are here because I've been spilling over for the last three weeks because this has been driving me nuts. Uh, when the Lord begins to give you a word, it just, man, it works on you. Somebody say faith. Have you ever noticed when you're talking, to, talking about Jesus to a non-believer how they kind of respond as if you're fe speaking in a foreign language? So you've got to kind of put it in terms that they can understand because we get so used to our, our apostolic lingo, we get so comfortable with you know, our, our own little idioms and things that we say in the church. Uh, and so many times in our Christian experience, we become comfortable with terminology and take the actual meaning of our apostolic lingo for granted. Everybody say faith. All right, we're working on faith tonight. Uh, most of the time, what we, we take for faith, we, we mean like a belief or a warm feeling. That's what a lot of people think faith is. A, a warm kind of tingling sensation you get. Uh, faith means belief. Faith means assurance. Faith means conviction. Um, the Greek word in the New Testament for faith is pistis or pistis. And it's the word that we get fidelity from. It's kind of odd, but the word in Greek for faith means loyalty. Praise the Lord. Somebody say faith. Okay, the disciples try to cast out this devil out of this guy, and it doesn't work. And the disciples came to Jesus apart in Matthew uh, chapter 17, verse 19 to 20. The disciples came to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, Ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Now, if we go back into the definition of the word we just worked on in Greek, faith meaning loyalty. Hang on. That's good. 
if I could trust you this much. If I could trust you this much, I wouldn't be able to say no to you. If I knew that you had my back, I couldn't turn you down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I just I just feel this uh, super chill manifestation of the Holy Ghost in the house tonight, so I'm I'm going to just tell you all about some stuff that's happened to me in the past. And one thing that was particularly impressed on me uh, was something I, I told Sarah about the other night. Uh, you know, I was talking about worshiping God. If you need a breakthrough, you need to an answer and all that, don't kill yourself over all your petition and stuff. Just worship God. Cut the angels loose to do their job. Okay? It was really cool one time. My brother was at the church in Moss Hill praying by himself, and it was about... It was about 10.30 at night. He's sitting on the altar like this. He's got his hands on his knees. And he tore his, tore his left knee out. Uh, I think he fell off a horse. And he blew his right knee out one time when he was trying to stretch out a pair of blue jeans. Either way, both of his knees were completely shot. Okay? And he's sitting on the altar, and he's not praying for anything. He's just worshiping God. And he's got his hands on his knees. And he's just sitting there telling God how good he is and how faithful he is and how much he appreciates everything he's done for him. And all of a sudden... He feels his knees get really cold. And the bones in his knees under his hands start moving. And God healed him 100%. I know he had shot knees. I know he had shot knees. And he wasn't even asking God for healing. He was just worshiping God. And God's like, you know what? <laughs> I got to do something for this guy. He's a good God. He's a worthy God. He's a just God. He's a just God. And it gets to the point where he just can't take it anymore. He's like, I got to bless him. I got to bless him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. A, a lot of, a lot of problems, you know, there's this thing going around in the world today. They say it does not matter what you believe as long as you believe it really hard. That's really, really big in, co in college. A lot of secular humanism and, and stuff like that. They say if you believe something hard enough, that makes it true. And that's a real problem for me because as soon as somebody says something like to, that to me, I'm like, tell you what. <laughs> if you believe really hard that you can fly, let's see you get on top of a cliff and believe really, really hard. I've never told anybody that, but I'm sorry. You can believe it as hard as you want to believe it, but you are going to fall every time. It's called the law of gravity. I'm sorry. That's the deal that's going around the world today. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it really hard. It's baloney. But the thing about it is, when we read this scripture, and they came to Jesus and said, man, why couldn't we cast this devil out? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. The, the word the unbelief right there is the same pistis or pistis, but with a negative on it. In other words, we wasn't tight enough. We wasn't tight enough. I can't trust you with that kind of power yet. You ain't ready for this. So all these things that you need breakthroughs for and all these situations in your life and stuff, would you just chill and get close to God? <laughs> Instead of trying to, to try to figure out some kind of ooh, turbo spiritual solution and stuff, just concentrate on your walk with God. Just grow closer to Jesus. Just spend time with our Lord. You know, He loves you, and He wants to spend time with you. Amen. Amen. We have to come to a place of maturity in our walk with God where we know Him and we trust Him. How many of you folks, when you came in here and you looked at the pew, you checked it real thoroughly, you, know, you looked under it and checked the supports and you walked around back and made sure it's, it's stable and everything. After you had thoroughly checked it out, you sat down. Nobody did that. Not, not one of us in here did that. We walked in and we said, that's a chair and sat on it. 
You trusted that thing. When stuff goes down and life gets hard and all that stuff, we need to have a good enough acquaintance with Jesus that we know who he is, and we know he's a good God, and we know he doesn't do cruel things to people because he's not like that. And you just flat trust him. That's just like when <laughs> it, gets, it gets to the point in this deal where God eventually makes fun of the devil. Amen. Hey, have you considered my servant Job? Make a fool out of yourself on him. Amen. Amen. Me and him are like this. You ain't going to break us up. There's nothing you can do and there's nothing you can say that can break him away from me. Whoa, man, if I had that kind of connection with God. Or the Lord's like, you know what? There is nothing that you can do to him that will make him turn his back on me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I've got two messages that smushed into one. I wrote them at the same time. But I pray that the Lord will allow the skill that I learned when I was a kid, which was tying my shoes, will, will flow into this message and help this tie together. In Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verses 11 through 17. It says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I just want to take a break right there. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Is anybody with me yet? It's not necessarily the person on the job that's giving you the trouble. It's not necessarily the boss. It's not necessarily the person at school. Whatever it is, there's spiritual things going down. Okay? So instead of getting irate and beside yourself and bitter against humanity and the person that's bothering you, just pray. Because God can handle that sucker for you. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take into you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. To stand. To stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We went through this deal in the hyphen class at Moss Hill, where we spent, like, two lessons on each piece of the whole armor of God. And the, the shoes were really like ancient cleats, basically is what it amounted to, ancient cleats. And uh, the point was is that there were these deals back then called stimuli or stimulus. They're, they would plant out there, and it was kind of like ancient landmines, effectively. And if you didn't have iron-shod sandals, you weren't going to take very many steps before you got one of those through your foot and then you're parked. It was really critical that not only did they have a grip on their reality, but they had to have... The ability to walk over painful situations. Oh, that's good. Woo. Come on. This faith thing that we're talking about, this loyalty, it's a personal loyalty. That's what fidelity means, a personal loyalty. The preparation of the gospel of peace is like, I've read the back of the book. I know what goes down. I know who is the king of this world. I know who created this world. I know who I am, and I know who he is. And I can walk through anything I have to walk through. I'm ready for it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take in the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I am kind of a history buff. I'm, I'm kind of a nerd. I was homeschooled. And don't look at me like that. There's a huge fallacy. Okay, it's, it's not a mistake. It's not a mistake that Paul said the shield of faith. It's not a mistake. You know, when these guys wrote all this stuff down, they weren't just thinking stuff up off the top of their head. They were under the influence of the Holy Ghost. And, and what is not breathed in the Scripture by God is written by His own finger. All doctrine is profitable for what? Instruction? Reproof? Doctrine? Correction? Praise the Lord. 
it's not an accident that he said shield. How many of you guys have ever used a shield? See, I'm the nerd in the room. How many of you know what it's for? In Sunday school, they tell us all about, you know, the only offensive weapon in the whole armor of God is your sword. These guys have never used a shield. The thing is, is that while you're away from me, this shield's got me covered and you can't hit me. But once you get within arm's reach, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with that sword. But if you step inside my space and you crowd me, man, ugh, get back. And what's really cool is that you deal with the word. But when you get the opportune moment, that faith can shove the enemy off balance. You knock him back. We have the power to push him back. Yeah, I'm dealing with the, I'm, I'm dealing with it with the word right now. But if you give me an opportunity, bam! And while he's stumbling back, man, I'm going in for the kill. All right, come on, preach, come on, preach it like you feel it. Fiery darts are just generic. A generic name for sharp flaming objects. Okay, y'all know that fire arrows historically were more scary than they were deadly. Because when you wrap that thing in the in the wool and dip it in the oil and you light it up and shoot it down range, it's man, it's bright and it's flaming and it's leaving a trail of smoke and it's really impressive. But that that deal on there that's supposed to make it more terrifying actually slows it down and makes it less deadly. You're not going to spook this. You're not going to spook this. Faith is a personal loyalty to Jesus Christ. Faith is a personal loyalty to Jesus Christ. And when everything is going down and it is terrifying, my personal loyalty is what is going to hold me. No, I will not let him go. Praise the Lord. It's really neat. It is not an accident that Paul called faith a shield. It is not an accident. One of my favorite, favorite sayings from history, when the men of Sparta would go to war, right. their women would hand them the shield and say, you come back with this or you come back on it. Woo. The thing about the shields back then is that they weighed 80 pounds. That, man, that's a ripped left arm. That's a ripped left arm. That shield weighed 80 pounds. And if you're standing firm and marching in line and everybody's holding tight together, no problem. But if, you drop, if you'd have to run, you just drop that sucker and turn tail and run. And if somebody came home without their shield, that meant that they deserted. And they tell them when they left, you come back with this or you come back on it. Because they used them like a stretcher. What's cool about the shield is that you can use it to cover your neighbor. That faith, that shield's big enough that you can use it to cover up your neighbor's weak spot. You see a problem going on, got a piece of his armor dented or something, you can shift that sucker up a little bit and cover that weakness. We come in here sometimes and our faith is down. But we can be covered by our neighbor's faith. And the shield is what keeps all the rest of the armor intact. That righteousness is defended by that personal loyalty to Jesus. It's not a matter of what does the Bible say about this movie. It's a matter of does this help my relationship with Jesus or does it hurt it? Is he going to like this, or is he not going to like this? I don't need rules. I don't need regulations. I don't need a bunch of stuff like a list that i got to knock out. All i got to worry about is what does Jesus want? What does Jesus like? That's what I'm about. That's what I'm after. I don't need a religious dogma. What I need is Jesus. What I need is Jesus Christ. What I need is the Word of God. It's really unique 
And really, it's, it's really, really interesting, really cool. Back then, everybody would march in rank and file and everything, and they would tie together in a phalanx, and it was, it was like an unbreakable shield wall. But what was neat is in spite of the fact that they were all in one army, and they all wore the same color uniform and all that stuff, each one of them had their own, their own family crest on that shield. And they stood representative of their heritage, of their lineage, of their descendants after them. I can't just drop this thing and run out of here. It's not just me. It's not just me, my family, my children, my grandchildren. I have to uphold the honor of my house. And I can't quit. I got to stay right because if I get careless, it might cause my brother to get hit. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you all another story real fast. Faith is not a warm and fuzzy feeling. And when these people say, I felt faith rise up in me, that's great. You know, that's, that's great. I'll take that for what it is. And I want to tell you something. There was a, a guy in my old church three or four years back. He came to me and said, I've slept three hours and four nights. I'm not drinking caffeine. I'm not playing video games. I don't know what's the matter with me. I can't sleep. And I mean, his eyes were so bloodshot, he could hardly keep them open. But he's like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I got to sleep. I put my hand on his head and felt absolutely nothing. I felt absolutely nothing. And I just said, God, let this guy make it home before he falls asleep. And when he falls asleep, keep him asleep until he's rested. And I felt absolutely nothing. That guy goes home, he makes it in the door, he collapses on the bed, and he sleeps 21 hours. I felt absolutely nothing. Faith is not a feeling. My loyalty, my connection to God will take me through highs and lows and emotion problems and, and sickness and depression, and no matter what I go through, you can't make me quit him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I, want to, I want to share something with you all tonight. I, uh, oftentimes, I have a real uh, sneak attack that I get in get into connect with the hyphen class. Uh, it's, it's a sneak attack. Thank you, sir. It's a sneak attack. That's what Brother Enrique told me. I uh, was a sneak attack guy. Uh, I, I'm the guy that likes to lay down with the sniper rifle and the ghillie suit and let the grass wave in front of you and wait four or five hours for the deer to walk out and shoot one time, pick that sucker up and go home. You know? Yeah. I'm a sneak attack kind of guy. So one of the ways that I, huh? At 200 yards. No, 200 plus. <laughs> it ain't even sporting if it's under 200 yards. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I got a good rifle. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So I tell them stories. And uh, a lot of times there's a, a principle or a moral or something in the story that either it's obvious or you got to figure it out depending on who it is and the situation and everything. But here you go. So there's these two guys. Uh, they were neighbors. You know, one day one of them sticks his head through the board fence and they're about four or five years old. Hey man, what's your name? Well, my name's Joe. Well, what's your name, Robert? You look like Josephine, not Joe. But in spite of the fact that Robert teased Joe about his name, they became fast friends. They grew up together, went through high school together. They were always together. They always stayed together. They were inseparable. They were like brothers. And then World War I breaks out. And of course, two guys were drafted. 
ended up in the same unit. They took some paperwork and stuff, but they managed to stay together. And they, they always had each other's back, all the way through basic, all the way through deployment, all the way into the horrible war zones and into trench warfare. The one thing that they had that they could count on was each other. And there's this, it was a horrible deal, you know, in trench warfare because they couldn't, they couldn't just go take a territory because you had this horrible gap between the lines called no man's land. And there's nothing out there but mines and barbed wire and dead bodies. And they would, they would do these massive charges and all these guys would go running out in the open and they'd all just get killed. And sometime they'd gain three or four hundred yards, but then they'd be driven right back again. Anyway, there's this one night where they... They're like, we're going to do a night attack. We're going to see if we can sneak up, on, sneak up on the Germans tonight. They get everything ready. Everybody's all psyched. and Everybody's prepped. And they're checking each other's gear. And they're uh, ready, to tear into the, ready to tear into the assault. And they start sneaking out. They're going across no man's land. Easing themselves around the barbed bar wire and all stuff. Watching each other. Making sure the other guy doesn't step on a mine. Watching sure you don't get tangled up in barbed bar wire. These two guys still taking care of each other. They get out there and all of a sudden a flare pops up. And all of no man's land is lit up for everybody to see and the German machine guns cut loose. And they tried to push forward and they tried to push forward but the fire was just too intense. They could not get through the barrage of machine gun fire that was coming at them. And so the captain calls retreat and everybody turns around and beats it back to the trench. They get back to the trench and looking around, calling roll, who's here, who's here, who made it back, and all this stuff. Josephine gets up, or Joe gets up, and he's, where's Robert? I can't find him. Hallelujah. He goes all the way down the line, Robert, dude, where are you? Looking for him. Goes back to where the spot where he knew Robert would come back to. He's not there. He's just about to jump over the edge to go back out there to look for him. And his captain grabs his arm, he's like, you ain't going nowhere. You ain't going nowhere. That's suicide. You're a dead man if you go over the top of this trench. And Robert, Robert says, I mean, just, Joe says, fine. Okay, whatever. Captain turns and walks off. As soon as he rounds the corner of the trench, Joe starts stripping off all his extra webbing, taking off all his extra gear. He sticks a pistol in his belt and dives over the top of that thing with the flares all flashing up in the sky, still open to machine gun fire. He dashes at a dead sprint out across here, and he's running top speed, going through barbed wire, dodging the landmines, trying to get through the craters. The machine guns are just tearing the sky apart with tracer fire. He gets to him, and he falls down, picks him up, and then he crawls back with him over the next six hours. Six hours later, he gets back in the trench. And Robert is dead. And the captain comes up to him and he says, Was it worth it? Was it worth it? I told you he was going to be dead. And Joe says, Yeah, it was worth it. Do you know what he said when I got there? I knew you'd come to me, Josephine. I knew you'd come get me, Josephine. We're talking about personal loyalty. Not, not some adherence to a list of rules and regulations. Not some, some system that we're tying into so we can have some kind of social upgrade. Not a way to tie into, a way to have blessings flowing into our life. We're talking about a personal loyalty between Jesus Christ and ourselves. He literally died just to be with us. Let's worship the Lord for just a second.
just like just like Esther when she said I don't care if it kills me I have got to see him I have got to see the king I don't care if it kills me just like Ruth when she said entreat me not to leave thee I'll go wherever I have to go and I'll do whatever I have to do and I'll give up whatever I have to give up to be with you that is how we gotta be toward Jesus we've got to be personally attached to Jesus himself a lot of the problems in our relationship with God we have is that we're too worried about all the stuff we're not worried about Jesus that one on one connection I ask you to just think about it for a second when you pray how much time do you spend worshiping God and glorifying God how much time do you spend to make him feel your love and not him make you feel his so many times we're like well I didn't feel anything when I prayed did he feel it did he feel your love did he feel your prayer when you prayed were you trying to connect to him or were you trying to get him to touch you says nevertheless when the son of man cometh shall he find faith on the earth we've got a million distractions we have a, we have just such a myriad of all these things coming at us every single day that takes our time and takes our energy and takes our money and all this stuff Jesus is a person not an entity And you're supposed to be able to, re to interact with Him on a personal level. Y'all come on. Come forward if you, if you will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.